heaven and earth than are dreamt of in our philosophy. There are more things in heaven and earth than are dreamt of in our philosophy. Hello, welcome back to Louis Sinclair Investigates the Doddleston Mysteries, where we're investigating an extraordinary story about a medieval fugitive, Lucas Wainman, who somehow was able to communicate with folk in the 1980s using some kind of computer, or Leem's Boist, Box of Lights as he called it, and given to him by someone or something possibly from the future. Because on the 27th of April 1985, Lucas had written to Ken, saying, You said your time is 1985. I thought you were also from 2109, like your friend who did bring the box of lights. Ken decided to write Calling 2109 on the BBC Micro's word processor Edward and waited to see what, if anything, would happen. And this came back. Ken, Deb, Peter... We are sorry that we can give you only two choices, that you either have your predicament explained that you may have instant understanding, but cause what should not be to happen, or try to understand that you three have a purpose that shall, in your lifetime, change the face of history. We, 2109, must not affect your thoughts directly, but give you some sort of guidance that will allow room for your own destiny. They had no idea what to make of this. How could they possibly change the course of history? And what guidance was it talking about? But with its use of the word we, it seemed they were dealing with a collective of entities from the future, who said that it wasn't willing to explain what was going on in case that disrupted the future. Very strange. And why the spelling mistake choices with an S, not a C? Ken's puzzlement turned to anger. He felt they were being messed with for some reason. That evening, Lucas wrote again. As before, I'll show the originals and translate them verbally into modern English, word by word where possible, so they're easy to follow and understand. It was actually a long and bizarre message, but this caught their eye. The foul man must see the king to tell him of the cat that did scare a mouse and cure your sickness. I will write tomorrow. I am not too well. Lucas, your loving friend. With the king living in London, was this in some way related to that very first message where it said, Pussycat, Pussycat, went to London to seek fame and fortune. Faith must not be lost, for this shall be your redeemer. The foul man? Was this a medieval pun referring to Thomas Fowlhurst, the sheriff? And did it mean that if the sheriff, the pussycat, went to London to petition the king, then all might not be lost? They suggested this to Lucas, who replied, It may also be my rescue. I shall make haste and tell him. Perhaps there was hope. But according to that first message, how could Lucas have foreseen that he'd end up in prison, needing the sheriff's help? Surely, if he'd known then that messing around with the leams boist would risk his being executed for witchcraft, you'd think he'd have got rid of the thing, or at the very least ignored it. Or was that first message actually written by someone or something else, who could instantly see all of time? But in which case, why had they signed off L.W.? Was it just to confuse the 1980s folk, or was there some other reason? 29th of April, 1985. After an agonising day of silence, the message they'd been dreading came through. No, I have not spoken with my sheriff. Tomorrow I do go to my king's court. There I cannot escape the dungeon. <laughs> 
If you do not speak with myself again, then I also beg that you write my book. Ken, Debbie and Peter were distressed. Would they never hear from Lucas again? And the book, what was its significance? 5th of May, 1985. At East Green, Debbie received a phone call from a builder friend who was working at the cottage. He'd found what he called foreign-looking words written in chalk on the kitchen floor, starting, he thought, with the word Peter. By tea time, Ken, Debbie and Peter had arrived at Meadow Cottage. The foreign-looking words were Latin. As before, I'll translate them verbally. Peter, too much, you ask. Lucas, furthermore, is going to die. Death he has brought upon himself. May the gods wreck your life. Another death threat from the past, written almost certainly by Lucas's distressed friend, who, as a fellow clergyman, would definitely have been proficient in Latin. The following week, a letter arrived from Robin Peedle, the librarian at Brasenose College, who'd helped Peter earlier. His investigations suggested that Lucas's real name was Thomas Harden. Surname spelt Howarden, but, as with the village near Doddleston, locally pronounced Harden. Robin added that the books that Thomas Harden had mentioned were definitely ones that religious scholars would have been required to study at the college in the early 1500s. Harden apparently had become dean of the college, a highly educated cleric, who, for being a Catholic, had fled the purges of the Protestant King Henry VIII and had never been heard of again. At long last they may have discovered Lucas's real name. But sadly, too late to save him from his court appearance and inevitable fate. 15th of May. There was a knock at the door. Following Peter's request in March, Dave Welch from the Society for Psychical Research, the SPR, had arrived and introduced his respected colleague, John Bucknell. Initially they seemed very pleasant, but then focused their questions on Debbie, almost accusing her of deceit. Needless to say, Debbie was deeply upset by their tone and protested that as someone who'd only been modestly educated, she wouldn't have been capable of writing in medieval English. Dave and John seemed to accept that. But on hearing that Meadow Cottage's loft space was shared with their adjoining neighbour, they felt that the roof void might have been used to gain access, hence the messages. Ken and Debbie protested. How could this have happened unnoticed when many times one or both of them had actually been in the property when the messages had arrived? This felt more like clutching at straws rather than a proper investigation of, at the very least, poltergeist activity. Then, after Dave and John's departure, the poltergeist nonsense started again, but with a vengeance. Chairs stacked on the kitchen table, the builder's tool chest, Ken's bicycle up against the kitchen door, and a plant tipped over on the floor. A couple of days later, after Ken had asked 2109 what his or its name was, 2109 replied, How can we have a name? We are many, but no more than one in the time to come. So 2109 was a collective. Then 2109 added that if they ever found out Lucas's real name, there would be no knowledge of you and your time to come. And everything that they'd experienced would disappear from reality. They'd only remember an alternative time without Lucas or 2109. They wondered if that were true, did 2109 have some kind of control over time and reality? And of course, with the help of the librarian at Oxford, they may indeed have found out Lucas's real name, Thomas Harden. A matter of concern, perhaps? And then another message came through. This is a friend of Lucas. You may call Thomas my name. And asked them what he should say to the king to help Lucas. In a moment of inspiration, Ken asked if he were the sheriff, Thomas Fowlhurst, to which the reply came, Yes. What was going on? The sheriff, the very man who'd sneaked on Lucas, was now communicating with them, using the box of lights that he'd told the authorities about, and by doing so had doomed their friend. And using it expertly, which was a bit suspicious. And both main characters from the past seemed to have the same first name, Thomas. Quite a coincidence. Debbie wondered, were all the people in the past, Lucas, his friend and the sheriff, actually the same person? or individuals 
collectively mind-controlled by external forces, like this 2109, perhaps. 25th of May. Dave Welch and John Bucknell from SPR arrived, loaded with equipment. First they sealed up the doors and the windows to stop intruders. Then they placed secret microphones around the kitchen to see if they could catch the hoaxer typing. They waited all day. Eventually night fell, and still nothing. Then suddenly a clattering noise came from above. Had the poltergeists come out to play? In the dark, Ken, Debbie, Dave and John crept silently upstairs, cautiously opened the bathroom door, and a shadowy entity rushed at them. <coughs> Just the neighbour's cat. That made them jump, but unfortunately nothing of note happened during SPR's visit, so Dave and John left, promising to return. Two days later, Fowlhurst, the sheriff, wrote describing Lucas's behaviour at court. He cried not for mercy, but did say the computer could only have come from God, and that they, his accusers, were no more than irreligious, half-witted rogues. It's they who should be hanged. Lucas certainly hadn't gone down without a fight, courageous to the end. But the end it inevitably was, and much to Ken, Debbie and Peter's dismay, also the end of a remarkable friendship across time. 29th of May Ken was visiting friends in Scotland, Peter was at his home in the nearby village of Harden, and Debbie, alone at Meadow Cottage, found herself in the equivalent of a WhatsApp chat with a sheriff. It started rather abruptly, with Fowlhurst writing just one word. Speak. Strangely, despite what she'd said to SPR about her and Ken's ignorance of medieval English, from this point onwards they wrote all their messages in this ancient language. And from looking closely at their grammar and vocabulary, I can say for certain that the medieval English that Ken and Debbie used was similar to all the messages from Lucas, his friend, and the sheriff. Which does rather beg the question. Peter, an English scholar, wasn't there to help them. So how could they have done this? Debbie replied asking if he could wait until the others returned. Fowlhurst wasn't satisfied with her answer and rather rudely retorted, I think you must speak more or I shall think you to be a half-wit. Then he asked her how long she'd be all by herself in the cottage. This sent a shiver up Debbie's back. After all, Lucas, seemingly, had materialised in the cottage and she certainly didn't want this creep to appear. It's fine, she said adding that she'd got lots of friends nearby who'd come round quickly if she needed any help. No reply. 1st of June, 1985. Peter, believing that Lucas had been executed, sent a message to Fowlhurst, asking who'd now moved into Lucas's empty house. Another strange and slightly aggressive reply. I think you know not of Lucas, for you say that Lucas is no more. What on earth did that mean? Was Lucas still alive? A couple of days later, SPR returned as promised, but no messages came through. Maybe that's because uh, Lucas has been executed, suggested Ken. Dave and John looked at each other. Yeah, right, they thought. That's one way of pulling the plug on all this nonsense. And they left. The atmosphere in the house was dreadful. Ken was seething with anger about SPR's silent accusations, and Debbie was sinking into depression. 6th of June. It was late evening. Ken and Debbie had settled to watch TV. Suddenly, what was that? It had come from the kitchen, sounding like a piece of metal violently hitting a wall. Then a cut-off from a copper pipe rolled into the living room, presumably scrap left over from some plumbing work that the builder had been busy with that morning. A few weeks later, Lucas's friend wrote to say that the only reason why the sheriff was keeping Lucas alive was because the box of lights wouldn't work reliably without Lucas being present. And the sheriff wanted control of it, to gain supernatural powers for himself. Regardless of this, they were overjoyed to hear that Lucas was still alive. But was there anything they could do to keep him safe? Ken had a light bulb moment. The sheriff 
and his belief in their unearthly powers was the key to Lucas's survival. Thomas Fowlhurst, if you try to take control of the computer, Ken wrote, will use it to damn your soul forever. Your only chance of salvation is to release Lucas. And the sheriff wrote back almost immediately. The ruse had worked. If you swear not to use your power, then I shall bring Lucas within one round of the glass. I, uh, I do beg your forgiveness, but I, I meant to cause no harm to him. I shall do this uh, for you be my friends. And next day, as promised, Lucas was returned home. He wrote, My three true friends, I do weep so that I may be with my friends again, at least for a short time. Messages between them flowed, including this rather funny one in response to Peter's descriptions of cars that could reach Oxford, 160 miles away, in just three hours. My brother Peter, you talk of things for which I have no understanding. It be sure that if a man were to take such haste in journeys, then would he not have his blood oozing from his ears? I told my horse of this, and it did think me a lunatic, and threw my saddle from his back for fear that I might impose this feat upon his poor self. 10th of July, 1985. Lucas wrote, saying that in return for his freedom, he'd been forced to sell his house and estate to local landowner Richard Grosvenor. This came as no surprise to Ken. He knew that until 1919 Meadow Cottage had been part of the immense Grosvenor estate. Later that month, Lucas had become very agitated. Following a phone call with Dave Welch and John Bucknell of SPR, Peter had asked Lucas if he'd write messages when these two, as he put it, learned gentlemen returned. This was the reply. My good fool, who be these men you say that do visit? Why are they coming to see my leams? For what purpose do these men do so? Pray tell their qualities and check their reasons, for it matters much, my friend. Lucas's concern was that when other people, rather than Ken, Debbie and Peter, were near their computer, his box of lights would fade, and he couldn't face never being able to talk with his friends again. Peter responded by asking why this fading happened. Lucas replied, I have no power over who can be near when the leams do shine. Lucas's response is certainly puzzling, so let's try and fathom out what this box of lights actually was. We'll start by asking, was there something physically present there? Lucas describes having a device, say Leem's Boist, a computer, that their friend, 2109, had brought him, and that it resembled a beeb, the lights which seemed to me to be identical to your computer, presumably the three bright LEDs on the case. Well, so far, it seems that Lucas does have a BBC Micro. Now let's consider a few practicalities. First, electricity. None. So, not a good start. But, because it was brought by 2109, who presumably had access to science way ahead of us, then perhaps there was some kind of energy projection or induction technology in play, powering it at a distance with no direct connection. Second, the keyboard itself. Of course, you and I have grown up with keyboards. Uh, here's my original typewriter from when I was 11. Little nerd that I was. But to Lucas and his contemporaries, a keyboard would have seemed alien. However, curiosity would probably have led them to press a key, and that would explain the opening of the first message written by Lucas's friend. He was obviously randomly pressing keys and discovering the repeat feature by holding the keys down. Then, on the third line, having worked out what the keys do, he composed part of a sentence. Then, heaven only knows what happened. I sent it to a friend, an amateur but well-regarded cryptographer, but apart from noticing that nearly all the letters were on the left side of the keyboard, a left-handed person perhaps, she couldn't find anything of sense in it. And anyway, if, by the third line, Lucas's friend had worked out what the keys were for, why would he have then typed a load of nonsense? I have absolutely no idea. Are there any code crackers watching who could help us solve this conundrum? Let's now move on to the main author, Lucas. Certainly he seemed very good at typing, 
Over the two-year connection, he wrote thousands of words, seemingly without any problems. But is that realistic? So let's consider whether Lucas's beam was actually some kind of hologram, one that is perceived as solid and, according to Lucas's friend, fades and disappears when others, rather than Lucas, are near or try to move it. In other words, a facsimile that, like an antenna, picked up the medieval folk's thoughts and transcribed them. And this could explain why, when those others were around Lucas's box of lights, their thoughts interfered with the telepathic transmissions and caused the muddling of the text. Let's move on to the third practical matter. Did Lucas have a monitor? From what's said, I, I don't think so. Logically, if there was a monitor connected to Lucas's computer, he'd have called the setup his Leem's Boists, his boxes of lights, the monitor and the BBC Micro itself. So if that's the case, how was the text displayed? The word Leem's lights has a rare secondary meaning, rays of light. So perhaps this refers to images being projected from the Beeb, hence Lucas saying, the Leem's do shine. Anyway, returning to the story, after Lucas's reply, Peter wrote back saying that all three of them would be disappearing for a day or two. Peter to France, Ken to Bristol, and Debbie to Oxford. Lucas was alarmed, thinking they were trying to escape from what he called the enemies of the Leems, the SPR. And rather like a warning about our widespread surveillance, he said, Does a person of your country cause problems for you? I think if your government does take and use my strange device for themselves, then it would become their play box. It is essential that your government does not take our computer. As a side comment, when I was preparing this, I gathered the quotes, labelling them alphabetically A through Z, then AA through AZ, and so on. And the label on this quote about government surveillance was AI artificial intelligence, rather spooky, as Mulder from X-Files might have said. Of course, it's probably nothing more than a coincidence, but it is curiously relevant to our conclusions. 24th of July. Eventually, Lucas agreed to answer questions from SPR's John Bucknell, who, on arrival, asked the others to leave him alone for a couple of hours. A moments before they returned, a long message came through from Lucas but John was not impressed. In a later interview, he said that he felt it was too much of a coincidence that whilst the others were at the Red Lion pub, nothing had come through. And the very moment that they were nearby, there it was. He suspected that they'd somehow sent the message from just outside the cottage, though that does seem rather unlikely, no Wi-Fi or the like. Then, seen on their monitor... Lucas asked 2109 what is, to our investigation, an extremely important question. Please tell me why you do move my writing so, 2109, for I do wish communication with my friend John. In other words, John Bucknell from SPR. 2109's reply came immediately, using Middle English, presumably for Lucas's benefit. Lucas was not to speak with such men. A few days later, Dave Welch and John Bucknell visited again. Ken told them about 2109. They seemed unusually interested. They suspected that this collective had the power of intervention, both physically and electronically, and was probably at the heart of a time-related phenomenon. They said that if one saw time, not as horizontal, with time flowing like a stream from the past towards the future, with us humans looking at reality through the blinkers, the slit that we call the present, but that it's vertical with all times happening at the same time, with unworldly entities able to move at will between the layers, or even exist synchronously through all of them, then perhaps that's what 2109 was. Omniscient, omnipresent, omnipotent, omnitemporal, and not to be messed with. And with that, the two SPR researchers left. Ken perceived a, a kind of disquiet, as if they were no longer thinking it was a hoax, but something of genuine interest, possibly of genuine concern. 
But by going early, Dave and John missed a long message from 2109. Basically, it warned that asking questions could lead to problems, that because the answers could never be understood by mere humans, errors would be made that could lead to devastation. It is better to have no knowledge at all than to have a distorted view of the truth because of your lack of understanding. But there was one more comment that puzzled Ken, though in hindsight he realised he should have thought more about it. 2109 warned them not to disrupt our experiments. What were these experiments? And how were they related to Lucas, his friend and the sheriff in the past, and Ken, Debbie and Peter in the present? Perhaps they weren't just passive observers of these strange goings-on, but, without realising, active participants being manipulated and monitored. And what were the dangers that this entity, 2109, had warned them about? How, by disrupting the experiments, whatever that means, could they cause the nature of reality to be threatened? Let's find out in the third and final part of the story, the time experiment. Until then, thank you for watching. Cheerio. There are more things in heaven and earth than are dreamt of in our philosophy.